Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining this morning. Uh, we are the Los Angeles South Chamber of Commerce and the Los Angeles South Hope Foundation. My name is Dexter McLeod. I am the president and CEO of both of these organizations. I'd like to welcome you again. Why do we celebrate Black history for one month? Well, we decided not to do that. We decided that there's enough content, there's enough information out there to share our rich history for 365 days per year. So uh, today is our inaugural event of our new initiative called Black History 365. So this morning we have a wonderful panel that's gonna discuss uh, some great topics. We ask you to continue to join in on our future events on this topic. So without further ado, I'm gonna introduce brother Ralph Softly, one of our members, and he's gonna take it from there. Good morning, Ralph. Hello. All right, hello everybody. I'm gonna be introducing uh, Ms. Ardina Brooks. I am going to go off camera so I can read it, then I'll be coming right back. So give me one second, please. All right. Okay. Ardina Brooks, originally from Washington, D.C., is the founder and CEO of Designs by Ardina. She began freelancing as a graphic designer in 2001 after fulfilling internships with the Japanese American newspaper in downtown Los Angeles and the John Wayne Cancer Research Society in Santa Monica. After graduating from the Art Institute of L.A., Ardina's career in the design industry began as lead designer for ever-increasing faith television ministries. Uh, for, pa for Pastor Frederick Casey Price, where she worked for 11 years designing book covers, CDs, magazine ads, logos, billboards, banners, and all of the promotional materials for their TV marketing campaigns. Now, in full-time business in the city of Inglewood, Ardina proudly offers photo restoration and legacy art from her home-based studio, helping to preserve historical and legacy photos. She continues to provide graphic design services, her own art collection, along with premium print and mounting services. Ardina is a lifetime member of the Recycling Black Dollars. Most proud to say she's approaching five years of membership in the LA uh, South Chamber of Commerce, serving on their marketing, concierge, and faith teams, and now on the education team. Her passion, her, her passion is truly preserving legacy through art. Ardina, please take it away. <laughs> All right, well, good morning, everyone. It is truly my pleasure to have this opportunity to be the moderator for this morning's um, Black Music in Los Angeles. This is definitely an honor. This is new. Just pray for me. <laughs> it's gonna be amazing. I, I've already heard um, so much information already about the person whom we're gonna be I'm talking about today. And it's just amazing how much information we don't know. And today we get to actually hear some amazing contributions and, and what um, this young man has contributed to music. So I'm truly excited about that. Now, Jean, I believe you're gonna go ahead and give a little bit about what this is all about and then we'll go forward. Well, actually, uh, um, if you don't mind introducing uh, Janice and myself, the background information. Okay. All right. Absolutely. All right. So, as well as Ralph. Start with Ralph. Yeah. So, our panel um, is Ralph Softly, Ajin Shahi, Janice Freeman, and then myself. So, the bio for Ralph Softly. Ralph Softley was born in Iowa City, Iowa. He has lived in a variety of communities throughout the United States, growing up with his father, who was a professor at Howard University and chemist with numerous patents. His mother was a school teacher. He served in the United States Air Force. Ralph has a career in sales with leading car dealerships, winning many sales awards. He worked with the Race and Humans Relations San Diego Unified Schools Program as Student Activities Advisor for the Outdoor Education Programs. Ralph currently has a successful Softly, I'm sorry, TravelSoftly.com, traveling agencies that specializes in local, national, and international travel packages. 
He is a stand-up comedian and an avid reader and a member of the Los Angeles South Chamber of Commerce. He is a member of the Chamber's Travel and Education Committees. Ralph grew up with his mother, who was a child pro prodigy pianist in her church. In Ralph's travels, he has studied and researched the contemporary history of music and is recognized for his insights on the industry, musicians, and music genres. Do you want me to read all of them? Yes. One time or before they come on? Um, why don't we have, just read them uh, uh, before they come on. Okay. okay, very good. So Mr. Ralph Softly. Yes. Music in our lives forever. Yes. Thank you guys. This, um, thank you for, for having me on this. I'm truly excited about this. Yeah, I like this music in our lives forever because as you, as you were saying in my bio, I moved around a lot as a kid. I was born in Iowa City, moved to New Jersey for the first time, then to uh, Kansas City, Missouri, and then to Maryland. From Maryland, we moved to Connecticut. From Connecticut, I moved yeah. back to like Texas, then out here. But with that, I got to listen to a bunch of different types of music. I mean, my mom was very instrumental in me and so was my dad in the music that I listened to, my, what I would call my foundation. My mom had a very extensive Motown collection. Supremes, um, you know, Temptations, all of that classic music. My father liked that too, but he was more for the blues. And as a kid, I was like, why? I don't get it. But now as I'm older, <laughs> I see why. And, you know, but, uh, but he loved Bobby Blue Bland. He loved B.B. Oh. King. And um, he also loved Al Green, who I liked a lot. And he also liked Barry White. So that was my foundation. Mm -hmm. And um, But a little bit about my mother. When I was a little child, uh, probably in second grade, I wanted to take piano lessons because it's, uh, it's um, as the um, thing, she was a child prodigy. She played piano by ear. So she was, in, by the time she was four years old, she was playing piano in the church. I thought that was the coolest talent to have. So I uh, got a piano teacher. The first week I went there, she showed me scales. The next week I went back. And then she's like, have you been practicing? I'm like, no. She, said, she sat me down and said, Ralph, the talent your mother had is, is from God. You're going to have to practice. <laughs> Thus ending my musical career. <laughs> <laughs> However, I've always had a love for the music. So it was always like when I lived in Maryland, they had the um, radio station WHUR, uh, Howard University radio station. Very, very instrumental in me just getting a new understanding of what, what music could be. Of course, Motown is great and I love it, but that's only part of the pie. Yeah. I then began to hear things like Donald Byrd, The yeah. Blackbirds, yeah. Uh, Quiet Storm, just so many different genres. Of music. Yeah. And then, you know, me and my brother being, you know, little kids, we began to listen to things like The Ohio Players, you know, <laughs> Cool and the Gang. Mom wasn't too hepped on it, but you know, what are you gonna do, you kids? So, I mean, and basically, and then as I got older, we moved to Connecticut and then I began to listen to stations like WBLS in, uh, out of New York and WKTU. Now these uh, WBLS had a, uh, uh, the uh, late DJ Frankie Crocker. He had a show that was just bar none. It was one of the best I've ever heard. Uh, and he would always play different stuff. And it was just very, very, very instrumental in me forming what it is. It's, what I would just call my taste in music, and I just go through all genres, basically everything but country and western. I know country and western, but you know, but everything else. I love jazz and everything. Uh, and so, with all of this, I've noticed that a lot of people you can just relate with people with music. You know, I basically say music is a soundtrack of people's lives because everybody has a certain something that they've gone through. And most of the time they'll have an album or a, an album that just got them through it or what would remind them of, or they'll hear a certain song and they'll go way back and I remember this. So that has always been my love for music. Um, and then coming out here to California and meeting with Ajit, we began to, um, you know, we would drive up to LA together. 
And at first there were, we would have like CDs and Ajin was not, he, he liked music, but wasn't the <laughs> aficionado. I'm not calling myself that, but I just know I love music and we would just listen to different things, just everything. And I would bring my CDs with me. And, um, and then finally, you know, later on when it went to digital, and we would be driving up there and Najin would talk about, um, you know, why, why do you like this better than CDs? Because I'm like, dude, if I have, at one time I had about 10,000 CDs. If I have 10,000 CDs, that's only, that's only part of the music. But if you give me the library to every artist, I can begin to just really listen to whatever I want to listen to. And then on one of those um, trips up there, he mentioned Ernie Freeman. And I was like, that name sounds familiar. Mm -hmm. And then that's how we got into this right here. Because I was saying, and I was just wondering to myself, I was like, why this man was a Titan. He basically set the blueprint, the foundation for what it is popular music is today. He was one of the pioneers of that. And why is he almost forgotten? Because I'm like I said, I really listen to music, so I remember him. But then I was like, when I saw all the stuff that he had done, I was floored that he was just like, he should be a household name. But guys, that's my time. Thank you for listening. I appreciate you. Man, that, that, that's awesome. I just wanted to share. I actually came out to California with a band. That's how I got out here. <laughs> oh, okay. In the music business and... Uh, I had never heard of Ernie Freeman. So when uh, Aj Ajin uh, um, told me this was uh, his relative, I'm like, how the heck did I not know <laughs> Ernie Freeman? Even though the names sound familiar, but not like, you know, Temptations or whatever. Mm -hmm. that, that, that's amazing. Well, our next speaker on the panel is Ajin Shahi. Ajin Shahi grew up in Los Angeles Compton, attending George Washington Carver Elementary, Vanguard Junior High, and Centennial, 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 thank you, Centennial Senior High School. He has a master's degree in consulting, um, content, woo, in counseling psychology, and a BS in behavioral science. While serving in the United States Navy from 1969 to 72, I didn't know that, okay. He was the Race and Human Relations Minority Affairs Advisor for the Commodore of the United States Pacific Fleet. From military to the education arena, Ajin was Program Manager for Race and Human Relations San Diego Unified Schools for 18 years advising seven superintendents and 10 years liaison for the People Advocate Program for African American Males. He worked for the district a total of 33 years before retirement. Ajin currently is a human relations consultant for Sandy, how do you pronounce that? Sandy, San Diguito. San Diguito, I saw. A school district for senior <laughs> management and school site principals. He is the LA South Chamber of Commerce Ambassador and Education Team Co-Captain. Ajin has received recognition and has been profiled, I know here comes that word, in the Pulitzer? Pulitzer. Pulitzer <laughs> <laughs> Prize winner, I'm learning today. Prize winner, Jonathan Friedman's book, From the Cradle to the Grave, The Human Race of Poverty. The Urban Institute of Washington, D.C. Successful African American Males Program and profiled as a role model for the State of California Education Department. Visions, a rights of passage book for African American males. Ajin has co authored Our Roots Run Deep, The Black Experience in California, 1900 to 1970. It's your choice. San Diego Unified Schools Role Model Manual for African American Males and authored Charles C. Flint, A Man and His Time, an unsung hero of the Los Angeles Black History, 1884 to 1933. Ajin is currently editing and soon introducing his latest book, 
in the Unsung Heroes series, A Musical Blueprint, Ernie Freeman, The Man and His Time. Isaine, you're on. Thank you, Arnetta. Um, this Ready. is, <laughs> I said, we have another person in our <laughs> chamber called Arnetta, and we <laughs> always get Ardita and Arnetta transposed, but this <laughs> is Ardita. <laughs> and Arnetta, if you're on the line, sorry. <laughs> so uh, this is uh, a moment that we have been awaiting for a while. It really began with my cousin Janice here, Ernie's daughter. Uh, we were passing the time in part getting through the COVID era, we call it. And every week we would talk to one another uh, without fail and just catch up with everything. And in those conversations, her dad would always come up. Uh, and, and I remembered him as, as a young boy. He was just Uncle Ernie, your cousin Ernie. Uh, I didn't know what we're about to share with you as she did uh, uh, growing up with him. So uh, what I would like to do is give you uh, a little brief outline of what we think will excite you about what we call reintroducing Ernie Freeman to the American public and, and, and world uh, uh, attention. Uh, the book that will come out will be very, very extensive, uh, uh, will be a tabletop, uh, a tabletop collection item. Uh, Janice has graciously uh, shared her father's collection uh, uh, with the Washington uh, uh, Museum in, in Washington, DC. Uh, uh, and uh, in the book will be numerous pictures uh, uh, from that collection, some never seen before uh, uh, by the current uh, uh, public. So we're going to start, with, uh, and we'll go with picture one. Ardina is going to be assisting us uh, 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 with a visual presentation. So Ernie's musical career spanned four decades, actually from the 1940s to the 1970s. Uh, Ernie has 120 gold records, over 20 gold albums, eight motion picture themes, and television specials and commercials uh, uh, numerous. Uh, our first picture uh, uh, will show uh, uh, Ernie, who began to play the violin and piano at age four. And uh, he was in uh, uh, his family's church uh, uh, where he began to show uh, uh, his early talents. Ernie's family in Cleveland uh, comes actually from generations of uh, 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 family history and background. And Ernie grew up in one of those, I'm going to say, proper middle class Cleveland uh, uh, backgrounds where there was a high expectancy uh, uh, for talent. And that talent uh, uh, was expressed. Uh, Ernie had an ancestor uh, 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 who also had musical ability, uh, but did not choose to uh, use his ability uh, uh, to, to earn the livelihood. So Ernie, in a way, has become uh, the product of that and will represent uh, the family. Uh, Ernie joined his sister, Evelyn, though that would be in picture two. <laughs> And in picture two, uh, um, Ernie, uh, and, and let me do a check. Now, I don't see the pictures. Can, can everybody else see the pictures? No. You don't see them? Oh, oh no. don't see them. OK, so we're doing the check, uh, uh, Ardina. OK, glad you said that. OK. Me... okay. And we'll just do a pause uh, because it's worth a, a check waiting for, uh, for the pictures. As you know, uh, in this uh, Zoom era, uh, is a back and forth of uh, uh, getting information coming through. And we're, we're developing the proficiency in that. And if these pictures do not come through, uh, uh, that's going to be okay as well. And I will continue the uh, dialogue, but let's just give her a moment. Can you so, see it so, uh, No, I don't see. Uh, I see I your screen. Don't... I do see your screen that you're sharing, uh, Ardina. Yeah, but uh, not the picture though, huh? We do not see a picture, we just see the screen that you're sharing. You may want to share that new screen if you see the picture. Sometimes it's, 
if you share you, something you know separately, it won't come up as your share screen. As you, let me try one more time. Is it okay. work? It worked earlier, right? Oh no, actually, it did work earlier. Hey, folks, we practiced this. Uh, <laughs> uh, we're all witnesses, and those pictures came out really, really nice. <laughs> okay. okay, so How about uh, now. Okay, so yeah. let's see what happens. Can you see it now? <clears throat> And we're okay, folks, because actually we're about five minutes ahead of time, <laughs> so it's okay. Uh, and look, this is the way of the world, okay? This is nothing new for us as people, nothing you can do, especially for us as Black folks, okay? It's all uh, good. Uh, uh, yeah, Ardina, it's all if good. you can click on that picture, it looked like you just have the files listed up here. Yeah. If you can try to open up one of those pictures. Can you open yeah, it up? I did, and... Um... I guess you're not able to see it. So let me just stop one more time because I have to stop sharing. And then I'll open it up. And then share. So maybe, maybe I have to go there. There, you there go. we go. Yay. All right, we did it. <laughs> okay, so that is Ernie. Freeman, okay, as my <laughs> wife would say, isn't he adorable? <laughs> That's Ernie sitting there with a the violin in his hand and the piano behind him, which he grew to demonstrate proficiency in into his adult life, as well as other instruments that he played as well, the saxophone, the clarinet, uh, uh, and the organ, okay? And if there are others, uh, when Janice comes on, she'll also <laughs> share that. But uh, uh, that's Ernie, and look at that presence, okay? <laughs> Let's go to picture two. Okay. And in picture two, you're going to see that Ernie joined his sister Evelyn's swing and orchestra band in his early teens playing piano and arranging music. He played at clubs regularly at the Circle Ballroom and broadcast with WHK radio station. Now his sister Evelyn, uh, an interesting story, uh, she had gone to hear the famous uh, Duke Ellington uh, play and decided, uh, and particularly as a Black female, that she was going to have uh, uh, her own expression. Uh, are we going to bring uh, picture two up? Okay, so that was going to be my question, so you can't see it. I think okay. what I have to do, okay, while you're talking, I have to go in and out of the share. Okay, it's all um, good. Do it. So, That's all good. And yeah. we're, we're having a good time here, folks. So so his, his sister Evelyn, and there we are. So okay. his sister Evelyn, that's her at the piano. And sometimes uh, uh, Ernie's dad, their dad, uh, uh, assisted with uh, what started off with a high school band, but grew to the proportions of actually playing regularly at clubs, uh, something called the Circle Ballroom. And Ernie uh, was very, very young. You can see him there uh, uh, on the sax. And he had to be around 14 years old. Uh, and yes, in those days, uh, folks had to do what they had to do. And sometimes our young musicians started very, very young. And there were not the restrictions that we have today for them to participate uh, uh, with adults. But certainly that contributed to Ernie's uh, acumen uh, uh, as a museum, uh, uh, as, a mu uh, as a musician. Let's go to picture three. And picture three, uh, Ernie uh, in 1941, he joined the US Navy with most of the males that were part of his sister's band. They became the first all black Navy band calling themselves the gobs of swing. So there you see Ernie uh, uh, in the front there uh, uh, playing uh, 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 the instrument and, and, and the others there. Now the recruiter who recruited them uh, really petitioned hard to get them to all join at the same time uh, because I think they had in mind that they wanted to start uh, showcasing uh, black talent there uh, 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 in World War II. So they were the face uh, of the black bands. There were some other small bands that did begin to uh, be created thereafter, but they were the major all black band traveling in parts of the United States and elsewhere uh, uh, by the US Navy. Uh, he returned home and graduated from the Cleveland Institute of Music in the footsteps of his sister. Uh, 
Uh, let's go to picture uh, three or four. Mm -hmm. Can you see it? Yes, that's a picture of uh, Ernie <laughs> uh, Cameo. And I wanted you to take a good look at Ernie. Look at that smile. Look at that presence. Okay. Look at that sax. Okay. And in the military. Okay. So our men, black men, contributed strongly uh, to the World War II effort. Okay. And like other uh, Americans, they did their part to entertain the troops, uh, to entertain the populations, uh, and to help us get through those difficult times of uh, World War II. Uh, if we go to picture five, uh, in 1940, uh, with his infant daughter, he moved to Watts, California, living in the military Jordan Downs. Uh, many people who are familiar with the Los Angeles area don't know that Jordan Downs began uh, as a military complex for ex-service persons uh, to begin uh, their lives. And of course, it was adjacent to the famous uh, Jordan Star uh, uh, High School, where actually uh, my mother uh, and uncles uh, uh, attended. He, at the same time, attended USC. Uh, and here we have a picture of uh, a senior recital on April 26, 1949. Uh, uh, and in the program, Ernie is playing uh, uh, the piano, and I believe uh, the clarinet, if I'm wrong, Janice will clarify that uh, uh, for us. Uh, but during that time, uh, uh, in the 1946, Lou Chud founded Imperial Records and hired Ernie to work alongside with Jimmy Haskell, a composer and arranger for many motion picture scores. Jimmy had worked with Elvis Presley, Neil Diamond, Crosby, Stills and Nash, and the Everly uh, Brothers. So you can see that Ernie was positioning himself and leveraging himself in the company of uh, musical uh, uh, pioneers uh, uh, in names and music, adding to his repertoire of uh, 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 experience. If we go to picture six, Ernie attained his degree in 1949. And soon after he played piano and traveled with Dinah Washington and Dorothy Dandridge who he gave voice lessons to. Dinah has been credited as the most popular black female recorders of the 1950s. Let's go to picture seven and we'll see a nice picture of, uh, I believe it's Dorothy Dandridge here, we'll see. And Dorothy Dandridge, uh, Ernie uh, and Janice may share uh, in her part that uh, uh, her dad gave voice lessons uh, uh, to bring into the world view the famous Dorothy Dandridge, and he also accompanied her uh, uh, on, in, in some of her supper club uh, uh, performances. If we go uh, in the 1950s, really begins to uh, uh, display and showcase uh, uh, Ernie. Uh, in those 50s, uh, record companies got wind of Ernie, and he began to make music jump as one recording artist explained. In 1957, Ernie's rendition of Bill Justice's Raunchy became number one on the R&B and number four on the Billboard National Charts. But before then, he had uh, the song Jiving Around, and you can see that it made its mark, okay, uh, 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 on the uh, charts there. Uh, if you go to uh, picture nine, So there's Ernie on the album cover, uh, and you'll see at the top of the song, uh, uh, Raunchy. Now, right now, when we look at this in contemporary times, we are so accustomed to seeing uh, particularly Black people on album covers and CDs and in the multimedia. But at this time, just to even be on an album cover uh, like this, Ernie was one of the pioneers in uh, helping the American mainstream public really get used to seeing us and seeing our faces uh, uh, expressed in uh, a musical uh, society. In 1958, 
uh, at the Cavalcade of Jazz concert at the Shrine Auditorium on August 3rd. Uh, Ernie was there with Little Willie John, Ray Charles, Sammy Davis Jr., and the famous Ernie Fields Orchestra, which was a Black uh, 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 orchestra leader, Ernie Fields, and Bo Rambo. Uh, if we go to picture 10, in 1958, Dick Clark created the Battle of the Bands. For three years, Ernie Freeman was the first Black orchestra leader at the, Holly, at the Hollywood Bowl. Now, this is really interesting, and I want to give a little background on this. Most of us are really somewhat familiar with Dick Clark, but you have to remember that Dick Clark is a phenomenon in the music industry. I grew up, and many of you may have grown up with American Bandstand. It's reported that two-thirds of the famous musicians and artists uh, by way of uh, fame uh, appeared <clears throat> on American Bandstand and over 10,000 okay performances took place on that. So let's look at Ernie Freeman. Again, Ernie Freeman's uh, leveraging and positioning himself in mainstream. Here he is with Dick Clark now, uh, and we'll go to picture uh, 11. And Dick Clark placed Ernie Freeman as the first Black musical orchestra leader at the Hollywood Bowl. So look at that picture. This is a picture that goes down in infamy. It just hadn't been done before, okay? A Black man leading, okay, that orchestra at the Hollywood Bowl. And in this particular performance, uh, Annette Funicello uh, uh, from uh, the Mickey Mouse Club, Dwayne Eddy, Jan and Dean, the Coasters, the Drifters, with an all-time attendance, turning away 5,000 people at the time for the performance. It was set up with loudspeakers six blocks away to announce that they were sold out. So again, Ernie was in a phenomenal role, a phenomenal place in history, working with the great bands of the time for three consecutive years with Dick Clark. If we go to picture uh, 13, and in picture 13, well, actually this picture here uh, uh, shows uh, Dick, back, uh, Dick Clark's Caravan of Stars there. And if we go to our next picture, in 1958, Richie Valens, took a Mexican wedding song and gave it a rock and roll beat that was to be the spark for Mexican influence on the Mexican scene. Well, Ernie Freeman was the pianist. Also in that year, there's Ernie at the piano and there's the platters, okay, singing Only You. And that was on a movie, uh, uh, Blues in the Night, uh, 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 that Ernie Freeman uh, made a cameo uh, appearance with the Platters. Now, in our family, we have a few musicians, and there is uh, Aunt Zola Taylor, who's an aunt, uh, and she uh, uh, was the first female uh, uh, to join the Platters. And if you saw the movie uh, uh, on the Frankie Lyman story, I think Hollywood, uh, uh, Holly Berry played her part uh, 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 and they picture her home in Los Angeles, uh, Windsor uh, Hills. Let's go to uh, the next picture. Ah, the Rat Pack. So in the 1960s, Ernie was on his way. Frank Sinatra, Disenchanted with Capitol Records, created Reprise Records with Ernie Freeman as the industry's first Black director of a recording studio. This is big, folks, okay? This is big. In 1960, uh, uh, a black man had positioned himself uh, with the top singer of the time, uh, Frank Sinatra, uh, to be the director, okay? And, and who was there? Uh, Frank Sinatra himself, Dean Martin, Joey Bishop, Sammy Davis Jr., Joe Stafford, Rosemary Clooney, Duke Ellington, uh, Frank's daughter, Nancy Sinatra, and stand-up comedian, Red Fox. So the interesting piece is, is that uh, um, 
Frank Sinatra wanted to do something really different uh, from Capitol Records, and he created what was called full creative freedom and complete uh, uh, ownership and publishing rights. And he did this, uh, again, having a black man at the helm, uh, Ernie Freeman. And it's no secret that those musicians there that I just mentioned, Frank Sinatra, Dean Martin, Joey Bishop, Sammy Davis Jr., all owe in part their careers to Ernie Freeman. Ernie Freeman, uh, uh, and you'll see him here on the next picture, uh, dark at the top of the stairs. Uh, uh, in that picture, uh, uh, Ernie uh, did the score uh, for the movie Dark at the Top of the Stairs. So Ernie was now moving uh, further into ma mainstream uh, visibility and invisibility, uh, because you'll learn from Janice that Ernie was a consummate musician. He really wasn't interested in floor showing or putting his name out, okay? He wanted to be celebrated uh, as a musician. So as you see some of these pictures, and particularly when you be introduced to the book, you're gonna be quite surprised uh, uh, to see, such as you see here. Uh, here he is with Sam Cooke uh, uh, and Ernie Freeman and Art LeBeau, uh, uh, the DJ at the famous Orpheum Theater uh, 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 there in, uh, uh, in Los Angeles. So that uh, Rat Pack, they owe their face uh, and their existence uh, to Ernie Freeman. Here's uh, Mr. Dean Martin. Dean Martin, it said that Ernie helped him resurrect his career when he did the song, Everybody Loves Somebody. Uh, that was so famous. Well, Ernie uh, uh, was the arranger. Also uh, his early rendition of Gentle On My Mind, later popularized by Glenn Campbell. Uh, here's Ernie uh, uh, and Dean. Uh, next picture. <laughs> In this next picture, then you're going to see uh, the gold record, thanks to uh, Janice. This is the actual gold record uh, that she has uh, uh, in her home uh, for uh, uh, Frank Sinatra. And it says in the bottom right, uh, Ernie Freeman, uh, who got uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the Grammy uh, uh, as the instrumental uh, uh, arranger. He was the second in music history. Uh, before that, Quincy Jones in 1964 uh, got it for uh, uh, I Can't Stop Loving You, Ray Charles, but that made Quincy and Ernie two black men carrying away uh, in the 60s the Grammys for instrumental arranger. And in the music world, instrumental arranger is something big. Here we are again for that Grammys, and here you see Ernie Ray Charles, you see the vice president of ABC, and, and uh, 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 they are, are happily taking the picture together, uh, uh, receiving that Grammy in Ernie's uh, hand there. Uh, next picture. Also, Ernie Freeman uh, worked with uh, Eddie Fisher. Eddie Fisher was the name in music uh, in the early 50s. Uh, uh, and, Ernie, and, and Ernie Fisher had a television program and song after song after song, millions of hits. And eventually uh, Ernie joined that team all the way until the 1960s, until uh, Eddie's last hit. So here's Eddie, of course, uh, I had to throw this in. Eddie was very famous for uh, his wives. There he is with uh, the famous Elizabeth Taylor the equally famous uh, 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 Debbie Reynolds, and not a picture. He went on to marry uh, Angie Dickinson, policewoman. Uh, uh, so Mr. Eddie was something else. Next picture. And in the next picture, uh, we actually have uh, a telegram from Dean Martin, where he's inviting Ernie, hey, put on your best tux. Uh, we're going to the Coconut Grove. And we're going to be uh, sitting there with Eddie Fisher uh, uh, as the festivities uh, uh, go on. Uh, next slide. So the other uh, uh, programs that we want to mention is that uh, uh, Ernie went on to receive many, many, many movie scores. And in those movie scores, uh, he had 1964 Ride the Wild Surf with Baby and Tab Hunter. Uh, Barbara Eden, 
1964, The George Raft Story with James Mansfield. 1967, The Cool Ones with Roddy McDowell. 1967, Double Man uh, with Yul Brenner. And 1967, What Am I Bid with Leroy Van Dyke. And in 1968, Duffy with James Colburn. And in 1968, The Pink Jungle with uh, uh, James Garner. And then we have a very, very uh, uh, interesting time as we move into the 70s. And here we see a beautiful picture of uh, Leslie Uggams. You may remember that she addition gained additional fame in Roots where she played Kizzy uh, and went on to continue to, uh, 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 to entertain us. In 1971, in the 70s, Ernie got the Grammy for Strings for Bridge Over Troubled Waters. Now we're gonna take a minute to talk about that song. That song by Simon and Garfunkel got six consecutive weeks of uh, uh, attention on the national charts in the United Kingdom, Canada, France, and New Zealand. Six million copies worldwide and one of the most performed songs of the 20th century. It ranked 66 on Rolling Stone's 500 Greatest Songs of All Times. Ernie Freeman got the Grammy for Strings. There were four other Grammys that were awarded also. Strings is very, very important. If you hear the song, you'll hear those strings. And next time you hear that song, think of Ernie Freeman. Well, we have Leslie here because Ernie really broke into a new tradition because at that time, television was emerging into the main streams of viewers. When I was a little boy, I was born in 1950. When I was a young boy, I remember seeing the first TV program by dating myself, okay? And we looked at it in awe. Uh, uh, and particularly when I saw uh, Skipper Frank uh, uh, come on and uh, when I saw cartoons that come on uh, 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 and even the Nat King Cole uh, uh, special. But it wasn't until the 70s that we had breakthroughs and Leslie Uggams had a main television program. And I wanna take a minute and remind you, Leslie said to the industry, I'm not going on unless I have a black uh, 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 conductor and orchestra leader for my program. And Ernie Freeman was selected for that position. So Ernie went on also, uh, next slide, Carol Channing. Carol Channing, uh, we know her uh, as the famous uh, uh, New York theater, uh, Hello Dolly, uh, but Carol Channing also had a TV program and who else did she ask uh, to be her musician uh, uh, and lead was Ernie Freeman. Well, the secret's out, it's not a secret anymore, just a little tidbit, it is Black History 365. Carol Channing told Ernie that her father was black. And that was a long time secret. It came out in her book. If you read her memoirs, Carol Channing did share with the world. Uh, and of course the word was used Negro. She said, my father was Negro. Uh, we didn't talk that up, uh, but I went on to move into mainstream society as Carol Channing. Uh, next picture, Harry Belafonte. Harry Belafonte, Calypso, West Indies emerged on the scene had a television program, uh, and it was Ernie Freeman uh, uh, who played uh, uh, the, the lead musician on many of his programs. Next picture. Ernie. Ah, here we are. So we have the famous Carol Burnett. Carol Burnett did an album and did a very, very famous song and she had to make sure that that was assisted by none other than Ernie Freeman. So let's take a pause here. Carol Channing, Leslie Uggams, Harry Belafonte, Carol Burnett. Um, it didn't get any bigger than those names uh, in the 70s. And here we are, our Ernie Freeman, uh, the little four-year-old, uh, with the violin and the piano in the background, 
rising up to be in the company and assisting these greats to be greater uh, and to work their way into the uh, hearts and ears of the uh, American public. So um, it's very interesting that you should also know that uh, he wrote scores and was pianist for the Perry Mason show. And by the way, Ernie Phil's orchestra was the main orchestra behind that Perry, uh, that very famous Perry Mason uh, theme song. And Ernie uh, was a pianist. The Green Hornet, To Catch a Thief. And if we have any children, uh, or when we were children, <laughs> Alvin and the Chipmunks, Ernie Freeman was on the team and it was his calculations that allowed the voices of the chipmunks to be synchronized to the musical arrangements and gave us Alvin and the Chipmunks. How about Huckleberry Hound? I grew up with Huckleberry Hound. Well, <laughs> I didn't know that Ernie uh, was the orchestra leader behind uh, the score of Huckleberry Hound. So we're going to end now and I want to do uh, a drum roll. And this drum roll actually will be uh, uh, the names of individuals that Ernie worked with. And I want you to sit back uh, and just think about these names as you hear them and wonder why when you hear these names in music that make up most of our lives listening, uh, why we don't know about Ernie Freeman and why uh, the LA South Chamber of Commerce, myself, uh, his daughter, cousin Janice, who you'll learn the work that she's doing uh, to reintroduce her famous father to society. Uh, 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 why don't we know about Ernie Freeman? So Ernie Freeman worked with a long list of arrangers, conductors, songwriters, and singers as a band leader, voice coach, producing, composing, directing, conducting, arranging, perfect pitch, songwriting strings, pianist, organist, for artists of the times. The list includes Bing Crosby, Frank Sinatra, Dean Martin, Sammy Davis Jr., Ray Charles, Andy Williams, Eddie Fisher, Quincy Jones, Robert Goulet, Mel Terme, Wayne Newton, Bobby V, Vic Dana, The Supremes, Sam Cooke, Willie Nelson, Johnny Rivers, Dame Shirley Bassey, Peggy Lee, Keely Smith, Edie Adams, Jan and Dean, Anthony Newley, Frankie Avalon, Patula Clark, Vicki Carr, Connie Francis, Jean McDaniels, Sandy Nelson, Dwayne Eddy, Jane Morgan, Johnny Burnett, The Crickets, Buddy Knox, Mae West, The Blossoms, Bobby Darren, Sandra D, Sonny and Cher, Richie Ballins, Johnny Otis, Nelson Riddle, Les McCann, Barbara McNair, Brenda Holloway, Johnny <laughs> Mathis, Pat Boone, Carol Burnett, Glenn Yarborough, The Platters, Dinah Washington, Paul Anka, Nancy Sinatra, Lionel Hampton, Marilyn McCoo and Lamont McLemore, The Fifth Dimension, The Mills Brothers, Diane Carroll, Dorothy Dandridge, Sarah Vaughn, Desi Arnaz, and as we mentioned, Alvin and the Chipmunks and Huckleberry Found. He even was the voice coach for Charlie Chaplin's wife, Lita Gray Chaplin. Next picture. So as we end, we lost our Ernie uh, in 1981 uh, uh, at the age of uh, 58. And here we have a telegram from Diane Carroll expressing her condolences to the family uh, 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 and many uh, greats in the music industry uh, uh, sharing uh, uh, their thoughts uh, uh, and family wishes uh, uh, to the family. Uh, next picture. So the musical blueprint, Ernie Freeman, The Man of His Times, uh, by myself, Ajin Shahid. Uh, uh, we're in the final editing stages. Uh, uh, we'll be coming out uh, uh, very soon and available to you. And again, you got only a snapshot 
okay, of Ernie Freeman. Wait till you see the pictures. Wait till you hear the stories. And many of the stories are contributed. Uh, uh, and if you'll come to the next picture, as we bring on uh, our uh, guest speaker and surprise guest speaker, Janice Freeman, the daughter of Ernie Freeman. And here we are at Janice's wedding, uh, walking down the aisle uh, with her dad uh, uh, and Janice. And uh, we'd like to bring Janice on. Uh, and Ardina, if you can give her bio. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's take a pause. You're right. Let's wow. Woo. Let's wow, because Janice is going to wow you some more. So take 30 seconds and just soak in what you heard, because that was a lot. You know, I just got to say, as you were giving your presentation, I'm back here. I'm just going, I'm shaking my head. I'm going, wow, this is yes. crazy. Yes, yes. Let me compose myself. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Bio for Janice Freeman. Janice Freeman was born in Cleveland, Ohio. She moved to Los Angeles as an infant and lived in the communities of Watts, Boyle Heights, Crenshaw, and Baldwin Hills. Janice attended schools in the Baldwin Hills community, Bishop Con uh, Conaty High School, Mount St. Mary College in Brentwood, Cal State University, Los Angeles, and graduated from Howard University. Yay. Janice attended Parsons School of Design and Pratt Institute School of Architecture. She retired from General Service Administration in 2006. While working at GSA, she designed, built, and managed the only federal design center and was later marketing business uh, accountant manager. Arthur, I'm sorry, Arthur Perry, renowned sports uh, collegian coach in Delaware Shore in a coastal community next to President Biden's home from Washington, D.C. She is married with three adult children and six grandchildren. Janice is currently active in the promotion and recognition of her father, musician Ernie Freeman, in projects with museums and documentaries. Documentarians. <laughs> so we welcome Janice Freeman. Thank you. Uh, Jean, I gave a good overview of uh, my father's career. I'm gonna try to give a little bit on the personal side. My father, and this is repetitious, but my father began his musical journey at four years old when he started playing the violin and piano. As a young child, he played violin in, in the Mount Olive AME Church in Cleveland, Ohio. My father and his sister Evelyn started a professional band in high school where my father played both the saxophone and clarinet and Evelyn played the piano. They performed all over the city, sometimes performing with their dad, Ernest Freeman Sr., who played the flute. When World War II started, the whole band enlisted in the US Navy, except his sister, of course. Ernie was the first band leader for the first all black US Navy band. And sometimes they marched in DC. After the war, my father finished his degree at the Cleveland Institute of Music. My father immediately moved us to Los Angeles in 1946, and I was just a baby, where we lived in Jordan Downs Public Housing in Watts. My father went to the USC School of Music on the GI Bill. And I remember that he took a streetcar and a bus from Watts to campus because sometimes I went with him. It was at that time that he pledged Kappa Alpha Psi fraternity. And I remember his paddle. And he played <laughs> many of the uh, gigs on weekends to make extra money. After my father received his master's degree in 1949, I wanted to correct something. The three, he had three um, 
instruments for his recital, and that was clarinet, violin, and piano. Yes. Okay, we moved to the Crenshaw area, as you, as Ajane said, then Ramota Gardens, public housing in East LA, and back to the Crenshaw area. Finally, in 1958, we were moving on up to Baldwin Hills. But Baldwin Hills, though, had a land covenant against Blacks, Hispanics, Asians, and Jews. We bought a contemporary home overlooking the city through a white architect who had designed and built the house for himself. We were the seventh black family to move to Baldwin Hills. Once we moved in, we received death threatening notes on our front door mm. and garbage dumped on our front lawn. Years later, Gertrude Gibson of the Los Angeles Sentinel Sentinel Entertainment columnist thing built a house right next door to us. My father was brilliant with a wealth of knowledge, but also humble, generous, and low key. He had great sense of humor. My father also had perfect pitch, which is rare. He could tap on any object and tell you the note. That's how he could hear a wrong note in the back of the orchestra. <laughs> he was all about the music, not notoriety. My father loved to entertain at home and have people over. When people gathered for whatever was the occasion, they would ask him to play saying, play Ernie, play. He would sit down at the piano and play and it was always magical. He played around town at various nightclubs, but he was a house band at the Intermission Club on Adams Boulevard near Crenshaw. We lived a few blocks away from the club. Occasionally, he would bring a caravan party to our apartment to continue after the club closed at 2 a.m. on a Saturday night. The other three tenants in our apartment building were invited, so they didn't complain. Hmm. Later, after a few successful records, my father went on tour with his Ernie Freeman combo. They all piled into his red Ford station wagon with a trailer behind for their instruments. The band traveled on the Chitlin circuit, mm -hmm. which went throughout the South and Midwest. Artists primarily made their money from touring, not from their records. Mm -hmm. My father was instrumental in helping to integrate recording sessions for black and women musicians. My father created the music behind the hits of the 50s, 60s and 70s, as you just heard, but few people outside of the music industry know about, about him. With his classical training, and church background that gave the music a special sound. His piano style of playing piano on these recordings added a unique quality as well. His brother, Art Freeman, also a musician, was his copyist. At my father's home office, he would create the arrangements, then give them to his brother to copy for each musician on the recording session. In 1962, my father had several popular records. My high school asked if he would play for our senior prom. My father gladly accepted. He did not only play for my prom, but he performed free and paid his band members out of his own pocket. Mm -hmm. After playing for about two and a half hours, he announced a special surprise guest, Outcomes. Chuck Berry, <laughs> place went wild. That was an amazing prom. That showed his generosity. On a side note, at my 50th class reunion, which I was unable to attend, I was told that the MC said, wasn't that the best prom with Ike and Tina Turner? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> with my father, I met many great artists. I was hugged by Dinah Washington in the early 1950s 
when my father was her accompanist. In 1955, I met Tony Williams of the Platters at our house. In 1956, Paul Anka took voice lessons in our dining room. I greeted pa Pat Boone at the front door when he met with my father at our house. I accompanied my father to Johnny Mathis's Hollywood Hills open house party. I went to several recording sessions, including the Supremes for their Christmas album and Dean Martin's recording session. I met Bobby Dearn and his wife, Sandra D at their home with my dad. And in New York, I met Diana Carroll at her Upper West Side apartment when my father was her musical director, just to name a few. Last story showing my father's personality. In 1971, my father drove a compact Honda, but he wanted to purchase a new car for my mother for a birthday, anniversary, and Christmas gift. If uh, his office was on Sunset Boulevard in Hollywood, Chasen Mercedes dealership was up the street in Beverly Hills. My father walked onto the showroom floor, casually dressed and noticeably black. The older salesman completely ignored him. My father spotted the, the, um, a metallic blue convertible on the showroom floor. He asked the young salesman who was a little more attentive if he would give him the specs on the car. The young salesman said that he didn't think my father could afford the car because it was expensive. <laughs> my father asked for the details anyway. The salesman gave him the information and price. My father said, I'll take it. Then the salesman kind of choked and said that he could talk about to him about financing. My father said that he would pay for it outright with a check. It just so yes. happened that my father's bank was right up the street. The salesman called the bank and verified that his check was good. Yes. My father drove the car off the lot. As he passed by the older salesman, he turned and looked over at him and shrugged and smiled. That showed my father's sense of humor. In conclusion, my father had a major influence on music, on the music industry, but the public doesn't know about his contribution. Therefore, in 2017, I donated 13 boxes of my father's music, gold records, photos, letters from notables like Bing Crosby and more to the National Museum of African American History and Culture in DC. I'm hoping that in this 100th year of my father's birth, to get support and help from the public to encourage the museum to display and make available his work and artifacts to the world. I wanna thank the LA South Chamber of Commerce for the opportunity to talk about my father. Thank you. And thanks to Ajin. <laughs> <laughs> Wow, that is so amazing, <laughs> amazing. Whew. All right. Well, you know, this is, we, we know that there's so much untold history and, and I am thankful to Dexter for even allowing this platform for starting uh, this portion of the chamber so that we can begin to highlight and, and preserve and present these unsung heroes that are in our families. I, I'm, I'm, I'm just honored, I'm so honored and I'm kind of speechless. But I'm also thankful um, that I get the opportunity to share a little bit with you all. Um, and I think that it, 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 it really chimes in with what we've already heard I'm a photographic artist and my passion is preserving legacy, but preserving it through art. So I'm gonna share with you just a little bit of what I do and a few of 
my artistic contributions that hopefully will be shared years and years down the road. Now let's see if this is gonna work here. Okay. And can we see the slide so far? Yes, we can see. Yes. Okay. So I'm, I, I generally do a presentation and this is gonna be a short presentation, but it's just to give you an idea of what I can do. And basically it's all about how to preserve our legacy, but preserving it through art. So what is legacy art? And to me, I define it as anything that's significant to you that you want to preserve and pass on from generation to generation, but through the vehicle of art. And art has been a way of communication from the beginning of time, basically. So I'm gonna start with photos that are damaged, they are old, um, such as some of the photos that we've already seen. And a lot of times people think that it's, it's, they can't restore them or they can't be saved or they can't be um, put in a position where they can continue to be shared. So I'm gonna just share with you seven common problems that I find um, with the photos that I have restored and repaired for my clients. And the photos that I'm going to show you, I will highlight, like I said, seven common problems. But in these photos, there are more than just the one um, problem, such as this. So I have cracks. And as you can see, there are cracks in there. It's deteriorating. Um, they're fading. You got it's tearing on the ends. Um, and pretty much, yeah, and it's colored in that too. And then I'm going to show you the artwork afterwards. And that is the artwork. So I've taken those two photos, not only did I clean them up, repair them and restore them, but I've also done digital painting and I have combined them into one piece of art, which is a collage. The second one is spills. This is very common, especially if we don't keep our photos um, in a protective environment, whether it's in a frame or in an album where you can place them into the plastic coverings. And then there's the artwork. Missing parts. I had a client bring me this photo. For some reason, they were mad at someone in the picture and they cut them out. <laughs> <laughs> But when they wanted to restore it, they only wanted to restore the grandmother. So I was able to do that. Here's another real common problem is when the photos are not only stuck to the glass, but the glass is cracked. And the worst thing you can do is try to pull it away from the glass because it's going, as you see those white spots in there, that's what's happened. They've tried to uh, remove it from the glass. So I have to scan it with the glass on it. And then here's the artwork. Tape. Please put tape on the back of your pictures. Not on the front. <laughs> <laughs> tape is one of the hardest things to remove, digitally remove um, from these pictures. Beautiful little baby. And then that's oh. <laughs> Isn't she precious? <laughs> fire and water damage, very common, especially fire here in uh, California. And then water damage due to a lot of our storms that um, we had throughout our country. And many times if there is some image left, then it can be repaired. And then that's the artwork. Fading, fading is the culprit. Our photos will fade. They will fade if you do not protect them. And even in protection, they will still begin to fade as well, but at a much slower rate. And I've not only repaired it and restored it, but I put them together. They are husband and wife. So I also 
take the acronym ARTS to kind of explain the process of going from repairing to creating the art so that you can preserve it. So A stands for assess. So the first thing we need to do is assess the problems and can it actually be repaired? So this photo is totally faded. I found out from the client what happened and they kept it in the sun. And basically the sun will definitely fade your photos, your artwork, anything that you put in the sun, it will fade it. And then here's the artwork. R stands for repair and restore, which is two different steps. Repairing is getting the scratches and the tears and whatever has caused the photo to begin to deteriorate or is deteriorated. And, I'm, and this is in the position of being repaired and restored. Now, this is a family member of Ajin. And Ajin, could you tell us a little bit about her? Well, this is my great-grandmother, Laura Flint. And she was married to my grandfather, who was a Los Angeles pioneer, Charles C. Flint. And Laura was a school teacher uh, from Missouri. Uh, and she has always been a family favorite of the family. And if you saw the picture before that Ardina showed you, uh, you really can't see her glasses, okay? You've got a fairly good background, but Ardina, if you look at the next picture again, she took it to a very, very different position. So she was married uh, 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 to Chelsea Flint and uh, uh, had uh, my granddaughter, their only child, Olivia Flint. And we went to Ardina desperate. <laughs> okay, and this is a plug for Ardina, uh, the Charles C. Flint. I've written the book, Charles C. Flint, The Man of His Times. Uh, you can see that on Amazon, uh, print and electronic. And my brother and I commissioned uh, Ardina, uh, and she restored uh, most of the uh, photos, uh, some 300 or more photos. Uh, she restored most of them and brought them to what we call museum quality. So to me, thank you so much, Ardina, and thank you for showing uh, and bringing to light uh, Miss Laura uh, uh, Jacobs Flint from Missouri, an early Los Angeles pioneer. And this is her around 1904. Thank wow. you. Wow. And thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to have done that. And then I also asked Ajin, okay, so can we take it to the next level, which is what I call the legacy art. Taking it to the next level is actually creating the art, digital painting, um, sometimes uh, creating collages, uh, just different ways to do it. But the main thing is how do we preserve it? And preserving it, I recommend having it mounted on acrylic, aluminum metal, or either canvas. And this is the next level for that piece of art. Oh, wow. <laughs> so here's where um, I've done digital painting. Um, I've created a creative um, border, which is one of my signature um, art styles. And then this was also mounted on acrylic and then on a frame as well. All the pieces can be on a frame or in a frame, but the main thing is the acrylic mounting and the aluminum mounting. Canvas is the third way, which most people are familiar with, but the aluminum metal is absolutely gorgeous and the um, aluminum, I'm sorry, acrylic as well. And then S stands for stories. Our photos are our stories and our stories are valuable. They are important. They are what makes or gives our stories visual, I mean, I'm sorry, the art brings the visual to our stories. So this is the beginning of my story as I tell my um, legacy stories. Uh, I'm the little girl is me, I'm six years old. We were about to go to the Philippine Islands, but each person in my family on my dad's side 
there is historical information about each one of them. And when my brother and I found this photo after my grandmother passed, we began to realize how much history we didn't even know about in our own families. So this is, begins my journey with telling people about my family as well. And then this is the artwork. So I've taken it from black and white and I do digital painting. This was also mounted on acrylic and then on a frame as well. So since we're talking about Ernie ah. Friedman, <laughs> this is one of the photos that um, Kajin shared with you. And I thought I would take a few minutes to do a little bit of photo restoration because he was such an amazing, amazing man. <laughs> and there's- Ah, yeah. nice. So, well, I worked on this just for about 30 minutes last night, just to bring it to fruition, just to give you all a taste of what it's like to restore, repair, and create a little art. So how will you tell your stories? That is my question to you. So will you begin a collection, a legacy art collection of your own family? Or will you just take a single photo and have it created into art? This is my mother. <coughs> my dad, my dad was in the Air Force. When he passed, uh, he was buried in uh, Arlington Cemetery and we received a letter from President Obama. Wow. And then this, I'm just showing you this because maybe you went on a trip that's memorable to you. It doesn't have to be an old photo. It could just be something that's memorable to you and you can creatively have it designed into art for your walls. So again, how will you tell your stories? Like Ernie Freeman, there are so many untold stories and they start right in our own families. Our history and the history of those who have gone before us are so important, so valuable, and so worthy of preserving, especially for the next generations who need to experience the benefits as well. And even though our special photos is only one way to tell our significant stories. It truly provides us with the visual component as an aid to communicate the historical stories. We can start in our own families as Janice and our panel has shared today. I really believe that it's our duty to tell these stories from the accounts of our ancestors to our own immediate families. And don't forget to sort through and preserve your own life collectibles of the many historical photos and valuable treasures. Because if you don't, who will? Legacy art is a creative way to preserve your significant stories that's captured in photos. And it is not only preserved by, I'm sorry, and it's not only preserves them by how they are beautifully mounted but it enhanced the experience of sharing the stories through the expression of art. So remember to treasure your own history in your photos. Continue sharing your legacy stories, such as we have so richly shared today of this incredible man, Ernie Freeman, because we owe it to ourselves, we owe it to our communities, and we owe it to the next generation to come. Thank you very much. <laughs> wow. So folks, this is a journey that we have asked you to join us. We also have, uh, uh, we call her the shy one, Nancy Renee, who's also part of our team. And Nancy also comes, uh, I'm gonna speak for her. Uh, she's gonna get mad at me too, but it's okay. Nancy also comes from a very famous family, the Renee family that has musicians in the family as well. 
And uh, in our future series, uh, I put Nancy on the spot now. So that means in our future series, we're going to get to learn about the Vinay family. But I'll give you a little hint. Do you remember the song, Why Do Fools Fall in Love? Well, find out from Nancy in a future presentation who in her family made that song happen. <laughs> so at this time, we'd like to open it up for any questions uh, that anyone might have. Are there any questions or statements or any comments? Me. I do. Hi, everybody. I am so excited about this. This, I got ideas just swirling through my head. <laughs> Black, Black Music Month is always in June. And mm -hmm. I think we need to highlight Ernie Freeman in Black History Month because mm. he's the one that started it. I mean, when I'm looking at Dean Martin and the Rat Pack, and, and I knew that um, Duke Ellington and Count Basie worked with uh, Frank Sinatra, because Frank mm -hmm. Sinatra was a pop singer. Mm -hmm. yeah. And they made him supposedly all things jazz. <laughs> really? And the people, <laughs> well, they do. Um, but I believe as we continue to talk about it, because these people don't have to be unsung. They're unsung because we're not talking about it and we're not putting them out front. Mm -hmm. So with the Bureau for June, let's make that happen. I'm just, mm -hmm. I'm just putting it out there. <laughs> we just need to make that happen. That's my goal. That's my commitment to to preserving the history of Los Angeles. And again, they're unsung because we're not talking about it. They're not supposed to promote us. It's all about self-promotion and being able to let our children know because I'm raising my grandson now. So he has to know about the history of where his mom is from, where his grandmother is from and the people who made it happen for the rest of the world. Because if it's not for us, they wouldn't have none of this. So, all right, Dexter. <laughs> Just so you know. But, but thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. That's it. Any other questions or statements? Hi, this is Regina. Not, uh, not really a question. Um, I just wanted to thank you guys um, for bringing to light how we should value our heritage, uh, get to know what our answer, and that Jean, you are awesome. You know that. I love when you tell your story about history because it makes me think. What, what my, my family and my family, we have pioneers. First time Black people doing, uh, working in companies, uh, Alphabeta, if anybody remember that, my mother was a pioneer there. My, my nanny was a pioneer with Local 399, uh, Kaiser Permanente Union and maintenance workers. And there's a room for her <coughs> at the union, called uh, Seventh and Union. And when you look at it, you know, we all have someone that's unsung in our families. We have pioneers within our own families. We need to learn how to find out what our past is, find out about who made things, because I wouldn't be here today. We all went to private school. We went to Regina Shaley, you guys know. Bourbon Day. I mean, I'm associated uh, associated with all the Catholic schools and things like that because we have we have we have maneuvered. Some of us have maneuvered and we've made a difference. You know, during the times when Black people didn't have any you know voice. So I, I'm just saying out there to everyone, this is a, a beautiful event that we're having here, and we should do this much more often, which I hope we will be, so that people can our young people can understand that yeah, you know, your your mother could be a pioneer. Your mother is an unsung hero because she made it through depression or she made it through hard times or she was in the battle when it was racial injustice, which we're living with today. So I'd like to thank all of you guys. You guys did a beautiful job and uh, I'm willing to be there for the next one. God bless everybody. We have Victoria had a question. Hi, I just love this presentation and I learned a lot more about uh, Janice's dad. 
Uh, Janice and Ajin, maybe you can um, answer this. Why do you think that he was not as well known as someone like a Quincy Jones? Was it his personality? Was it the Times? You know, do you think it was because they weren't really pushing black folks? You know, at that time, they'd rather keep him like more of a secret or what, why do you think that is? Janice, why don't you start that oh, off? Yeah, I'll answer. Hi, Victoria. Um, I, I think it's because my father was so low key. He didn't promote himself. He was the man behind the music and he was all about the music. It wasn't about him. Um, so I think if he could have, you know, if he had had a different personality, he probably would have been out front, but um, that was him. The way that I would answer that, Victoria, is um, Ernie was so mainstream that I don't think he thought he had to sell himself. Because if you think about the talk we provided, he leveraged himself into the very front of the music industry, and he just was, okay? Now, he did die a very early age, okay? And at that age, okay, and in 1981, just when, hold on just a minute, I'm going to have to cough. <coughs> Excuse me. Just when the industry was really starting to take off, there were times, for example, you mentioned Quincy Jones. He and Quincy Jones, uh, were in front of and behind one another and paralleled one another uh, uh, in their careers. Many were first by Ernie, some were first by Quincy, but Quincy lived on. Had Ernie lived, 58 remember, had he lived even one more decade, at 68, okay, or two decades, at 88, like Quincy, who would we be talking about right now? Well, Ernie isn't here to speak for himself, but we are. I'd like to add to that too. Um, I'm thinking, especially back during that era, our black people were not promoted like other nationalities, particularly white, white entertainers. And I think too, as a people, especially an artist, you're so caught up into what you're doing. You know, your your, cre your creative people, are, and I'm and I'm speaking even for myself. We're not so trying to put ourselves out there. Something that you said, um, er, um, Ajin, how Ernie positioned himself. Right. He was posi probably not intentionally, but it was just this is what you do. You know, right. you're playing with these people, you're, you're, you're writing for this people, these people, you know what I mean? It, yes. it was like a way of life. Let me say it like that. It's a way of life. So I'm just wondering if maybe that might have been um, part, part of the reason, somewhat intentional from the marketing um, team, the promoters or whatever, and then as a people, like I said, you, you know, you're just, you're in your flow. You're, you're doing your thing. You know, I got a gig here, I got a gig there. You know what I mean? But it's, and, and you're depending on whoever or others to actually do that promotion. So I, I, I'm just saying that maybe it just wasn't as highly promoted, like you said, um, the, all the, the Rack Pack. Um, it, it, that's, I don't know, that's, that's just what I, well, I did not like where you are, but I want to say this, and I know we're nearing our ending time. Mm -hmm. uh, when you get a chance to look at the book, we go extensively uh, into a genealogy that Janice has done extensive research on Ernie's genealogy. And I'm going to tell you, it's a matter of breeding. We just have to get that in there. Okay, Ernie came from a history of family and family accomplishments. And so he was really a part of that large body of Black people who live in the mainstream. And because they just are, they're not celebrated. They're not tooting a horn. They just do what they do to make America great. OK? And it's larger than we believe, much larger. Mm -hmm. Well, excellent, everyone. Uh, <coughs> our clock here, tick tock. 
Uh, we are going to close up. Uh, Darlene, I do see your question. We're gonna hang around for another uh, few minutes after uh, we log out of Facebook and on our live stream here. So you all please stand by. Uh, but I just wanted to thank you all again uh, for joining us today as our inaugural Black History 365 event. Uh, as our panel mentioned, there's more to come, more to come. There's a lot of history, there's a lot of content, there's a lot of unsung stories that we don't know about. And I was equally um, just impressed and, and just excited to hear these stories about Ernie Freeman. And again, you know, it's something that we just didn't know about. Uh, but there's a lot of these tales. So I want to thank our panel today, our moderator, Ardina Brooks, uh, Brother Gene Shahid, who's our uh, co-captain with our education team with the Chamber. And of course, our guest speaker, Je Janice, what's your last name? I'm sorry. Freeman. That's Freeman? it. Yes, there it is. Yes. <laughs> there it is. So that was a very special guest. Uh, that, that they, uh, uh, Brother Gene, you got me surprised me with Janice coming on. Uh, this morning, all the way from uh, Delaware. So thank you. And also joining. Ralph. Also Ralph Softman. There you go. My brother Ralph that opened us up today as well. Thank you, uh, Jane. So, and thank all of you all for joining. So we're going to sign off at this time. And again, the rest of our panel that's here on the Zoom call, you all can hang around and uh, we could go ahead and uh, ask some more questions. So again, thanks again for uh, tuning in today. Uh, look forward to our upcoming events, Black History 365. Why just celebrate Black History for one month when we have hundreds and hundreds and even thousands of years of history? And, and we're not just talking about Black history. We're just talking, we're talking about uh, real history. How about that? Uh, that's been uh, overlooked, overshadowed, and ignored over the years. So God bless y'all. Have a wonderful day. Thank you very much. Well, uh, there's time for a few more questions. <coughs> and excuse me, folks, I've actually have a post nasal drift and I did well all the way to the end. <laughs>